Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today is the third Sunday of the season of Advent. Advent means coming. And Advent is the season in which we wait for, prepare for, and look forward to Christ's coming. Two weeks ago, we lit the first candle of our Advent wreath. The candle symbolizing hope. Its light continues to burn, a sign that our hope continues. Last week, we lit the second candle on our Advent wreath. candle symbolizing peace. It still burns brightly, a sign that God's peace will endure. Today we add to these the lighting of the third candle. The candle of joy. As we wait for Christmas and the birth of Jesus, we look forward to the joyful Christmas celebrations we will share with those we love. Prophet Isaiah speaks of the wilderness and desert blossoming in faith and joy. And Jesus performs acts of compassion and mercy that sets the prisoners free and brings delight to the poor and hurting. The good news of Jesus' coming is indeed news of great joy for us today. As we continue in our Advent worship, let us use this as an opportunity to look beyond ourselves. Let us anticipate angelic tidings of great joy that will soon come. Let us open our own hearts to the joy of the season, to the joy of the coming of Christ. Welcome to the weekly online worship service of the Fries Valley, Yerkesville, and Janaden Hut and Moravian congregations. It's good to have you with us as we worship together. Today is Sunday, December 17th, 2023, and this is the third Sunday in the season of Advent. I'm Pastor Dave Geyer, and I'll be helping with today's service, and I'll be providing our message, which I have entitled, Advent Joy. Now, the biggest announcement to highlight is that one week from today is, of course, Christmas Eve. In each of our congregations, we will be offering a worship service at the regular time in the morning, and these will be services focused on singing Christmas carols. We will also be offering an online service the morning of December 24th in this traditional format. Christmas Eve evening, we will be offering our candlelight services at 5.30 p.m. at Eurexville Moravian Church and Fries Valley Moravian Church, and at 7.30 p.m. at Janaden Hutton Moravian Church. And for our online viewers, our plan is to live stream the 5.30 p.m. service at Fries Valley. It will also be available for later viewing. Now, if you do plan on participating in that online service, it is our intention to email out a program or bulletin to accompany that 5.30 service at Fry's Valley, and that will provide you, for example, with the words to the carols that we'll be singing during the service. If you're on our email list, you can expect to receive that bulletin by the Friday beforehand. However, if you're not on our email list but would like to receive that bulletin, we want to add you to that email list so you can get in touch with our church office. You can find that information in the comments section below to request your copy of the Christmas Eve bulletin. You can also go to our website at www.sharedmoravian.org. And again, there's a form there that will allow you to get in touch with our office and make that request. And now, as we continue in worship, let us quiet our hearts with a word of prayer. O Lord, we have been counting down the days until you're coming in this Advent season, and now it is getting closer than ever. O Lord, as we gather with anticipation in this service, may you be truly present with us wherever we find ourselves in this moment as we offer you our full attention. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.
well with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you as your children this Advent, anxiously awaiting the celebration of the arrival of the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, our Savior. We are so grateful for your protection and guidance, but we are keenly aware of those in need of your healing, comfort, and care. May your hands touch them and help them in their way. Now we will pray the prayer that you taught us, joining our voices and praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Today's reading comes from the New Living Translation of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 24. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. Now, may the God of peace make you holy in every way. And may your whole spirit and your soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. God will make this happen, for he who calls you is faithful. And now it's time for a moment for God's children of all ages. Hey there, kids. So Christmas is getting closer, right? Are you excited? Are you counting down the days? How many days are left until Christmas? Do you know? Eight, that's right, just eight more days until Christmas. And for many people, Christmas is the happiest time of year. And people do all sorts of things to add to that happiness. Here are some things that I can think of that people do to help make this a happy season. See if you can guess what I'm thinking of. Here's the first one. What might this remind you of? Yes, it's a Christmas tree. It reminds us of Christmas decorations, beautiful decorations we put up as a way of helping everyone feel happy in this special time. Here's something else I'm thinking of. See if you can guess what that is. That's right. This is the time of year when we have Christmas gatherings and Christmas parties with folks we love. And doesn't that make you smile? Here's something else we do at this time of year, many people. That's right, a Christmas cookie. We make all sorts of treats and goodies and we share with one another. That helps make us happy. It's good. And here's something else I'm thinking of. What could this be? That's right, this is the time of year when we give presents and we receive presents. And doesn't that help you feel happy when you give or receive a present? All of these things, putting up decorations, gathering with people we care about, making and serving treats, opening presents, and giving presents too. These are all things people do to make this time of year as happy as they can make it. And you know, there is a special type of happiness, a deeper type of happiness, that is just waiting to fill our hearts this season, if we will let it. This deeper type of happiness is called joy. Joy is a gift from God. It doesn't depend on people or what they do. This joy comes from what God has done. At the very heart of Christmas is something that God has done. Christmas is about the birth of Jesus, our Savior, God's Son. Yes, Jesus, our Savior, is born. He's born for us, and He is God's special gift to us. He has come to show us just how much God loves you and me and how far God will go to save us and claim us as God's own. 
And when we come to really understand about Jesus, and when we open our hearts wide to welcome Jesus as our Savior and our friend, well, we might just begin to experience a taste of something special, this deeper type of happiness that we're talking about, a deeper type of happiness than we'd ever known before. And this is joy. Now, the things people do to make this season special, the decorations and the parties and the treats and the presents, all of them are great. I love them all, don't you? But you know, even if we didn't have any of those special things this Christmas, not a one, we still have Jesus. And having Jesus is all that's really needed for us to experience the joy at the heart of Christmas. Shall we pray? I'll pray and you can pray after me, okay? Dear Jesus, you are the greatest Christmas present. Thank you for your love for me. This Christmas season, I open my heart to you anew. May I know the deep joy of your coming. Amen. Well done, kid. Good job. And Merry Christmas. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Welcome to the third Sunday in Advent, 
And today our theme is joy. But what exactly do we mean by joy? If you were to ask most people to define joy, what would they say? Well, my guess is that many of them would describe joy as an extreme form of happiness. Happiness taken to the nth degree. Isn't that how many of us think of joy? The way this line of reasoning goes, it's sort of like everyone has a built-in happiness meter, kind of like an internal thermometer. And the happier you are, the more the mercury in your happiness meter rises. And if your happiness meter gets high enough all the way to the top, well, that's joy. At least that's the way many people understand it. So let's take Christmas time for an example. Under this reasoning, the key to experiencing Christmas joy is to do everything we can to create as much happiness as possible, to raise our happiness meters to the top. And so let's say we put out a bunch of beautiful Christmas decoration. That's, that's nice, and it raises our happiness meter a few degrees. Well, then we get the whole family together for a big family gathering, taking care that every detail is just right, and that pumps up that happiness meter a few more levels. Vacation from work or school, Christmas cards, Christmas Eve services, the, they move the meter higher and higher, and then comes giving or receiving the perfect Christmas gift, and that raises the meter even higher. And if all these things come together just right, if we've achieved our goal of the perfect Christmas, then the happiness meter has reached the top, it crosses the threshold, and turns into, you got it, joy. At least that's the way joy seems to be understood by much of our culture today. No wonder everyone feels so pushed and stressed, so rushed to get all this stuff done in time for Christmas. Everyone wants to experience a joyful Christmas, and we want those around us to experience one too. And when we believe that the way to joy is for us to complete enough of these smaller, happiness-producing holiday tasks to push our happiness meter to the joy level, no wonder we feel so driven. Decorating, Christmas lights, visits to mall Santa, Christmas cards, Christmas cookies, Christmas photos, Christmas parties, shopping, wrapping. We'll do whatever it takes to have a joyful Christmas for ourselves and those we love, even if it kills us. Isn't that the cost of Christmas joy? But what happens when things don't go according to plan? What if the stress of all this busyness gets the best of us? And instead of making us feel happy, we end up feeling frustrated and exhausted and taking it out on folks around us. Or what if no matter how hard we try, we just can't get it all done in time? Or what happens if we do everything in our power to perfection to raise that happiness meter to the top, but then things don't go the way we wanted them to? People can't make it to our Christmas party, or they do come, but instead of a happy time, there is conflict. What if that perfect gift we work so hard to find isn't wanted or appreciated? What if in spite of our best efforts, our happiness meter doesn't make it to the top? Maybe a little happiness, but no joy this Christmas. Is that what it means? Is that how joy works? And this isn't even mentioning those among us who, for any number of reasons, just struggle with Christmas period. I think of those who are hurting, those who are grieving, those who are facing personal or financial struggles. Their happiness meter is pegged at zero. They're not feeling happy at all. So if joy depends on happiness, it's out of their reach. If. Joy is really just an extension of happiness. But what if joy, at least the joy the scriptures speak about, has little to do with our happiness meter? What if the joy the scriptures speak of is a separate, deeper, and more profound thing? What if it's possible to know this joy even when we are suffering? even when we are grieving or hurting or struggling or lonely. 
Today's scripture from Thessalonians suggests this very thing. Within the early Christian churches, the believers in Thessalonica might be considered the poster children when it comes to joy. Earlier in his first letter, Paul tells the men, women, and children of this congregation that they've become examples to all of the other congregations in Greece and Macedonia. Other believers throughout the region are being inspired by their joy and the sincerity of the Thessalonians' faith. But here's the thing. These folks in Thessalonica who are such an example of joy well, they are at the very same time suffering. They're suffering because of their faith. There'd been a growing backlash against the young Christian moments and movement, and the folks in Thessalonica were experiencing it firsthand. They were tr being treated as social outcasts simply because of their faith in Jesus. Some had likely been disowned from their families. Others were losing their jobs or having their businesses boycotted. And some had died, quite possibly losing their lives because of their faith in Jesus. These were not happy circumstances. And yet, somehow, the Thessalonians were overflowing with joy. Clearly, this joy that they were experiencing was not coming from their circumstances. But then, where was it coming from? Paul points us in the right direction when he describes their joy as joy in the Holy Spirit. And so somehow this joy, this joy of the Thessalonians was directly connected with God and their faith in God. This joy was a mysterious God-given gift that was lifting their spirits even when their circumstances had gone to pot. And toward the end of his letter, when Paul encourages them to always be joyful and give thanks in all circumstances, he's not encouraging them to do something new. He's basically saying, you're doing such a great job. Keep it up. Your joy has been such an inspiration to the rest of us. Nurture it, protect it, guard it, stay on the course. What we can take from this is that the joy we talk about in Advent, well, it's not about happy circumstances. It's not about us climbing that happy meter. No, it's based on something else entirely. Advent joy, the true joy of Christmas, if you will, that doesn't come from completing all the million and one things we feel compelled to do in our quest for the perfect Christmas. The true joy of Christmas, it's a God thing. And if we want to know it, the one to look to is our Lord. In this country, over the last five or six decades, there's been a well-known person who, through his own story, has tried to bring this message home to folks like you and me. His story revolves around his personal quest to discover whether there was any real substance to all this talk about Christmas joy, or whether it was instead just a bunch of cultural smoke and mirrors. His quest has become an icon in American culture, a story repeated many times and across several generations. And my guess is you've heard it a time or two. Now, I'm not gonna name him just yet, but as I describe him and his story, see if you can figure out who I'm talking about, okay? So this fellow's quest began when he admitted to himself that all the talk about joy and Christmas seemed like just empty words without any real substance. Those around him were doing all of the holiday stuff that presumably brought joy to the season, the elaborate decorating, the presents, all of it. But honestly, it all seemed so superficial to him, so commercialized, so hollow. None of it seemed to be any real reason for joy. And the more he thought about this, the more disillusioned he became. And as Christmas drew closer, he entered a state of depression. He sought help from a mental health professional, and she advised him to get more involved with others, which he did. 
And shifting his focus off himself, he looked into an environmental cause he cared about, dabbling in forestry, getting more involved with others, looking beyond himself. Both of these things helped in dealing with his depression, but they didn't provide any answers to his actual quest. He still hadn't found anything that justified the joy that was supposedly at the center of this season. He was on the verge of giving up on Christmas entirely. But then, in a poignant moment, his best friend spoke the words that for him changed everything. Just that suddenly, hearing his best friend's words, the light bulb went off. And not only did he realize that there was something to this idea of joy, but he actually experienced that joy himself. When I step back and consider this famous guy, his quest, his best friend's words, well, you're welcome to form your own opinion, but I believe he and his story might have been sent to us by God to help our culture rediscover the true joy at the heart of Christmas. And when his friend speaks his unforgettable words, I believe they're like the words of the prophet speaking to our American hearts today. So... I mentioned this guy on, the guy on this quest was famous. Any guess about who he was? If you guess Charlie Brown, you're right. And the story of his quest, it's a Charlie Brown Christmas. And who is his best friend, the person who just might be God's prophet to us? It's Linus. Who among us, if we've ever watched a Charlie Brown Christmas, could ever forget Charlie Brown's disillusionment with the commercialization of Christmas and Snoopy's gaudy dog house decorations? Can't we recall his visit, driven by depression, to Lucy's roadside psychiatry stand? Or Charlie Brown's compassionate interest in a scrawny little Christmas tree? And surely we'll never forget that moment when Charlie Brown finally cries out in desperation, isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? And Linus answers, sure, Charlie Brown, I can tell you. And the lights dim and Linus, blanket in tow, enters the spotlight. And quoting from the Gospel of Luke, he begins, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And Linus goes on to tell the story of the birth of Jesus. When he's done, there's a dramatic pause. And then Linus says, that's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. You remember how in that moment, Charlie Brown smiles for the first time. Now at last he's been given a real reason for joy, and the reason is the coming of Jesus. His quest is completed. The coming of Jesus is so wonderful, so glorious, so full of hope and promise for Charlie Brown and for Linus and for the whole peanut gang and for you and me and our culture and our world that this warrants every bit of joy any of us might hope to feel this Christmas season. Charlie Brown's quest for true joy has, in the end, led him to Jesus. And all of the kids come together. Their hearts have been softened by the story of Christ's birth. And instead of mocking Charlie Brown's little tree anymore, they decorate it together. They make it glorious. As the story comes to a close, Charlie Brown joins them. He sees his little transformed tree and his heart now bursting with joy. He and all the children together sing the good news. Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. And the message is unmistakable. The coming of Jesus is what makes this season so special. Jesus coming is the reason and all that is needed for joy. Amen. And now our benediction. 
Good news, the King is coming. Good news, each moment our Lord draws closer and closer. He comes with salvation and there is healing in his wings. And as you depart from this space, may this good news fill your heart with gladness. May you go forth from this space with joy. Amen.